Uh, yeah, my, like she said, thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Imad Khan. I, uh, as you can probably see, I'm not from here, but uh, uh, I'm actually working in Berlin, and uh, I work as a machine learning engineer at a company called Flix. How many of you have heard of Flix? Flix was. Don't ask me for Googles after the talk. <laughs> but uh, if you've not heard of Flixbus, what Flixbus does is essentially it's a bus uh, service provider which takes you from point A to point B, uh, specifically intercity. So uh, if any time you decide to go to Berlin or to anywhere in Germany or anywhere else in Europe, you know where you have to look for. So yeah, uh, we have. Uh, so I work as a machine learning engineer at Flix. I've earlier been a data scientist uh, at multiple companies. I have tried to start a company of my own. Uh, if you want to talk about those misadventures, we can talk about them after the session today. Uh, and yeah, so that, that's a little bit about myself, so that we get context to, as to where I am coming from. I'm originally from India, some of these companies. So this is also the company, Recreate AI, that is no longer existing, that, that, that I, I, I was running. Uh, this is another company in India. So I'm originally from India. I've worked in India and Germany. Uh, so that is a bit about me, and uh, quickly agenda for today. Uh, I will start with a little bit of motivation for MLOps. If you were in the other session today, where uh, I think there was another person who was presenting a little bit of, 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 about MLOps, uh, it's going to be slightly different, so I think you will like it. Then we will look into the MLOps lifecycle, we will look into how Zen ML assists in the MLOps, MLOps lifecycle, then ML core concepts, architectural diagram, and we will go through an example of the ML pipeline. I know it's a lot uh, of stuff that I'm planning to cover in the next 20, 25 minutes. So uh, are you guys ready? Yeah. yeah. OK. Are you guys ready for a story, maybe? Do you want to hear a story, or do you want to hear this? Story, story. Story? Okay. Let's start with the story. So uh, let's start with the story of a data scientist who is working at work. And what he is doing is trying to work on a machine learning project. And he, what, uh, typically, a data scientist or a machine learning engineer would go to the Jupyter notebooks, Jupyter lab, or whatever tool you're using, even VS Code, uh, build up your machine learning code, uh, look at these evaluation metrics, maybe plot some charts to make it look more fancy and sophisticated, and then come up with findings if this model is working as intended or is, is this model not working as intended. So you have so this is the story of a data scientist who is at work developing uh, their models and trying to solve business problems. So let's I don't know it doesn't look like me but let's assume that's me. Uh, and uh, yeah so that's what is happening and what you do after you develop your model is essentially you go and present your work. You present your work to whom? You present your work to, oh, okay. The boss came quickly and went. So you present your work to your boss. Uh, and you say, okay, say, hey boss, this is what I found. Uh, I was working on this machine learning project. And now this is, these are my results. Uh, I think these results are good enough for me to develop uh, this, this application further, make sure you can use this application. And basically I think, this application or this solution that you see here is solving the business problem, right? So you're presenting this to your boss. Your boss has a wry smile on his face, maybe because he's more confused than happy, but uh, he's trying to just understand what is happening. But he approves and you are jumping with joy. So now you, the data scientist, have presented your work, a machine learning project, your boss has approved, and now you're like, hey, my work is done, right? So you, you were supposed to build a machine learning project, a uh, machine learning model, you went and trained your machine learning model, and the model was uh, presented to your boss, and your boss said, hey, it looks good, approved, and then you're jumping with joy. Is this the end of your work? The answer to this question varies. You might have expected no, but the answer to this question actually varies. Sometimes it is the end of your work. If maybe you just want to uh, expose the results of your project as a dashboard, and you, there is almost already a dashboard team that is working, you can just share those results there, and that's where your work ends. 
right? So sometimes this is actually the end of your work, but not all the time. And I, uh, there is, I know there's a lot of talk around MLOps in the industry, and that's why I want to bring this point. Not everybody needs MLOps. Not all projects need MLOps. Not all projects need to be deployed, right? So it's important for you to figure out which projects are the projects that need to be deployed. But let's say, in this case, it is not the end of the work, work for our data scientists here, because otherwise my presentation will end here. And I don't want that to happen. So let's say now this model needs to be deployed. Right? So this model that he has developed, is, uh, this is not the end of the road for the model. And if you want to deploy this model, what do you do the first thing? The first thing you do is you go on Google or these days ChatGPT and search online how to deploy a machine learning model, if you don't know. So if you've been a data scientist, and if you're not trying to deploy stuff, data scientist who's lived most of his or her life in a small room and inside Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebooks, you don't know how the world looks outside. So what you do is you go and search on Google or ChatGPT and say, I want to how to deploy a machine learning model. And there are lots of results that come, but of course first are the sponsored results, but for, for the purpose of my talk, there's this MLOps keyword that actually came up, so I just took the screenshot and I get it. So what do you want to do? How to deploy a machine learning model, and then people are talking about MLOps. Right, so now you know that once the model that you've developed, if you want to deploy that, you need to start reading about or looking into something called MLOps. But what is it actually? So as you're reading, your happiness actually moves to an expression like that because machine learning is not just modeling, but it is more than just modeling, right? And this is actually uh, taken from a paper that Google uh, put out, which uh, says that your machine learning code is only a minute part of your machine learning pipeline. You have so many other things that you have to look into or take care of, uh, things like configuration, data collection, automation, data verification, feature engineering, testing, debugging, and so on. What's also interesting is that uh, most of these things on the left side of ML code are the things that you would have anyway done while developing the model. All the things on the right side of the code, uh, sorry, on the right side of ML code, this is the right side, yeah, for you guys, okay, this is the right side, yeah. So uh, on the right side of the ML code are the things that you have to take care after you develop the model. So when you're looking to deploy the model is when these things become important. So what is the MLOps lifecycle? And as you're reading that, you figure out that, okay, there are some, some people who have actually researched on this topic and uh, have shared their thoughts, and also you figure out as you are working in the field. So this is the MLOps lifecycle. This is also, again, taken from a Google paper where they have researched and uh, formulated the cycle. And also, while you work on machine learning projects, you will realize that what you're doing, your machine learning development, that's where you start, right on the top. And after you actually develop your model in your local systems or local environments, you have your training operational, operationalization. So which basically means you want to operationalize your training process. Or in other words, you want to set up a pipeline that allows you to continuously update your training of your model. Right? So what, what was a one-off run in your Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook should now become an operationalized process, should now become a reproducible process that you want to update on regular intervals. So that is what training operationalization means. Then you have continuous training, and basically once you set this training pipeline, it allows you to continuously retrain your model. Right? So that happens, uh, and then, I mean, of course, you after you do this, this is I think secondary, but you can, after you finish your development, you already deploy. After you deploy, you have your prediction serving, continuous monitoring. So all of these happen simultaneously, and in between, you would want to manage your data and model. The data, so essentially the metadata around your data and the model. So every time you run a pipeline, it, uh, it has its own data that it generates. Every time you uh, store a, an artifact, 
it has its, it has its own data that it's generating. So basically what you want to do is store that while you're working in this MLOps lifecycle. Right? So there are a lot of things apart from, so, so let's say you just started working as a data scientist. Right? So what are you taught in your courses? So you typically said, you're typically, typically asked to learn which is the best uh, classified algorithm or which is the best uh, regression algorithm, right? So uh, you, you must have heard of linear regression or random forest or gradient boosting methods. So all these kind of methods that you study for and you try to figure out if this uh, kind of uh, algorithm is the best fit for my data set. But that is not the end of your machine learning application and that is what MLOps is all about. So that is one part, the ML code is the one part, but once you finish that part, is where you have this entire life cycle. And now let's move on to ZML. Uh, basically, ZML is a tool, uh, as, as promised uh, in the title of my talk. So ZML is essentially a tool that brings everything together. Uh, like I showed you earlier, there are different parts to building your machine learning pipeline, right? So you have different things, but what ZenML actually does is it acts as a glue between all these different parts. So uh, these, these are, some of these are renamed, but this is what essentially you would build in a machine learning pipeline, right? So you would have all of these feature stores, orchestrators, data validators, code repo, secrets manager, and all these different components that you need to build a machine learning pipeline. And that is what ZenML does. It brings all of these together. So we will start looking into more of what ZenML actually is. And at the core of ZenML is a pipeline. Right? Uh, like like uh, many of you, how many data engineers are in this room? Okay, so you guys already know what pipelines mean. You are essentially, I think, I think uh, they are also known uh, famously as plumbers of data science, right? Because uh, you need somebody to do the pipelining work and uh, make everything ready for the data scientist or machine learning engineer. So famously, data engineers are known as machine as like plumbers of uh, data science. But uh, data scientists themselves are now becoming plumbers. So it's it's a it's a sweet revenge for data engineers. They are also very happy that you guys are also turning into. Numbers. But at the core of ZML is a pipeline, right? So you're trying to build pipelines. And what does pipeline have? A pipeline has multiple different steps, right? So you have different steps, and you, when you put these steps together, it becomes a pipeline. So it, this is an example pipeline that you see. So you have an import step, you have a profiling step maybe, you have a train step, evaluation step. So when you put all of this together, it becomes a pipeline. And that is at the core of what ZML does or what you, have, what you do while building your applications using ZML. You're trying to build pipelines. You're trying to uh, put together steps and build pipelines for your machine learning applications. And that's it. So if you want to use ZML, uh, basically what ZML does is it reimagines your problem statement as different machine learning pipelines. It could be a training pipeline, or it could be a production pipeline, as we will see as we go ahead. So at the core of ZML is a pipeline. And ZML pipelines, they run on stacks. Stack is another concept within uh, the dictionary of ZML. And like I showed you the pipeline earlier on the left side, uh, the pipeline still exists, but this pipeline now is running on a stack. What do I mean by stack? So uh, we will get into what, what stack means uh, as we read through the different parts of the stack. But essentially stack uh, means a, uh, putting together different components that you need your pipeline, that your pipeline needs to run. Right? So it's a very simple way of understanding. What is a stack? A stack is a collection of components that your pipeline needs to run effectively. That's, that's the basic simple definition. You have the orchestrator, which orchestrates your code. We, we, had, a, we had a talk on Airflow sometime 
back today. Uh, your orchestrator essentially acts as your airflow in this case. Right? You can, you can orchestrate your pipeline runs here. There's an artifact store, which basically stores all your artifacts. It could be your model outputs, it could be your intermediate step outputs, all of that can be stored within an artifact. Right? So basically, these two, and these two are the bare minimum, that need to be part of your stack for a pipeline to run. So when you write a pipeline, so basically when you write a pipeline, I want to import data, I want to train data, I want to evaluate data, you write this pipeline, you also need to define stack for it to run. So basically, if you, it's, it's, it's basically like if you're a plumber, you put together different parts, you want to put this part inside a bathroom, it's basically like you need to figure out where the bathroom is. Right? So the stack is essentially the bathroom. So it's like where do you put the pipeline? So anyway, there are different kinds of orchestrators and artifacts. So that is where I think ZenML uh, is very different from the different MLOps tools out there. So ZenML says we are very generic. We don't depend on any one particular kind of tool. We can integrate with any tool. So ZenML says, okay, you want to orchestrate on your computer, you can use the local orchestrator. But okay, you want to dockerize your stuff while you're working, you can use the local docker or orchestrator. Or you want to say, move it to the cloud where you already have an Airflow instance or a Kubernetes instance. You can use the Airflow orchestrator or a Kubernetes orchestrator. Right, so now, just by changing the stack, you can change where your pipelines run. And that is the beauty of ZML. That is where it differentiates from all of the different tools. Okay, now your model outputs and your step outputs, they are being stored in the local. But if you don't want to store it on your local uh, computer, you can put it on Amazon S3 or on Google Cloud Storage or Azure. So you can choose your stack as per your, the way you're developing. And that is where ZML actually shines. I will quickly go through now, I think I am, I will quick, I order that a lot of time. So basically, uh, how does a pipeline get created? Uh, you write a pipeline by configuring, you write a pipeline by writing the different steps. You configure a ZML stack and switch between stacks depending on need. Like I said, you can have many different combinations of these. And that will give you different kinds of stacks. And you can customize stack with different components, right? So that is essentially what a ZML pipeline creation does. And like I was talking about, you can switch between stacks with just a single line command. You can say, this is my local stack. You can say, this is my production stack. And you can just say, okay, this is how I'm going to change. So maybe while you're working, you can keep everything on your local stack. And while you want to deploy, you just move everything to production stack and everything is in production. So that is how you can quickly work iterate and evolve your machine learning pipelines. I will move on to the architecture diagram. I don't think I have the time to explain this, but I had originally thought how I wanted to, I wanted to show how it works. Basically, you have a ZenML server, you have a client, this, there is your pipeline written over there, and once you uh, write a pipeline, you can dockerize your pipeline, and the dockerize is pushed to the container registry, and then that is also pulled by the orchestrator, and the orchestrator basically runs your pipeline. But uh, that is in short of uh, what architecture diagram uh, is trying to show basically how ZenML operates. I will, yeah, I wanted to show you this, an example ZenML pipeline. So this is something that I worked on for the conference. What I'm first doing is uh, installing ZenML server, and I'm also installing the other integrations that I need. So I have sklearn, mlflow, evidently. So like I said, ZenML is like a glue which puts together all these different components. And then I initialize a ZenML pipeline by saying ZenML in it. And then it starts creating a ZenML pipeline. And again, now after I initialize a start, a start ZenML pipeline, I want to register my experiment tracker, my model registry, my model deployer, my data validator. So I'm just registering all of them. Basically what is important for you to see is this. So this is a stack. This is a real stack which has orchestrator default. I did not change the orchestrator. My artifacts store default, but I can also have these other component types that I didn't show you initially. I said stack can be expanded. So a stack has model registry, experiment tracker, data validator, model deployer. So all of this together puts a bring, a make, makes one 
general stack. I have five minutes to go through this quickly, so yeah, you can now give okay, example pipeline. How do you define a pipeline? You use the Python decorator pipeline, and that's it. It becomes a pipeline. You say, uh, this is my pipeline, this is my uh, training data loader, trainer, evaluator, model. So these are my arguments, and basically you call those functions. Training data loader, trainer, evaluator, model register. So this is where you actually define the pipeline. Uh, now you start writing the steps. Okay, what was my first step? If you see the previous slide, my first step was training data loader, right? Now I want to load my training data, so I say add step, or the decorator step, I start defining my training data loader, right? So this is my uh, Python function with, uh, with, with basically what it should do, training data loading. The next step is, yeah, so again, one by one, if you go through the steps, you have three clear ML flow. This is your modeling step. Then you have another evaluation step. So you, now every part of your machine learning pipeline is a step. Like I said, you have to write it in steps. And after you write all of them in steps, you create an instance of your training pipeline. So you say training pipeline, these are my functions, dot run. And when you say run, it starts running the pipeline. And you can see here already, this has loaded, it has finished, this has started, it also outputs your accuracy and everything that you can track. So this is what I wanted to show in the architecture diagram. Uh, this is also a recent change that they never did. Earlier they did not have a dashboard separately, but now they have a separate dashboard where you can see how many pipelines you have created, how many runs are there, how many stacks, how many components. And you can again, trigger and do a lot of things using the dashboard. So this is also something that Zenimal provides you where you can yeah, basically use a UI interface to make your changes. Uh, this, will, this is actually the DAG visualization, DAG visualization of the pipeline I run uh, and, and I, I showed it to you already. Yeah, I, I think you need to explore here. There are a lot of artifacts and everything here that you can actually go and uh, see. So, what are the final few takeaways uh, that I would like you to take away from this talk? Is that machine learning is more than just building models. ML code is one part of a machine learning application. ML ops lifecycle actually begins after the model development phase. I have not gone into how you can evaluate your training data or your test data uh, as, as things go. So that is also another entire different field where you have data drift and all of that. But that is that is perhaps another conference next year. But yeah, so what is what is ZML? ZML is a useful tool to connect all these different stages during the MLOps lifecycle. And yeah, I would suggest you guys try it out and see how, uh, how, how it performs for your use cases. Thanks for listening, uh, and yeah, I'm open to any questions now. <laughs> Think we have a minute? We have a minute. Uh, is it cloud based or is it uh, installed on uh, your computer? Because I, I, I can't see you. Okay. Is it cloud based or installed on uh, your computer? The server is local, but you can also move it to the cloud. So that's, you can set it up. Right now, it's local. everything that is always local, but you can also put it on the cloud. But they don't provide uh, anything cloud based yet, as far as I know. Is it open sourced? Yes. Yeah. So in your code example, I saw that you used our flow. As far as I know, our flow can be used on its own for uh, yes. for creating ML ops. Yes. So ML flow is one part. So it will do experiment tracking, and it will do uh, it will do experiment tracking for sure, right? So it will tell you how many experiments you've run and all of that. So ML flow does that, but does it do data validation? Well, like for for example, evidently is a tool that you can use to do data validation, which checks for these skews and drifts, but MLflow doesn't do that. So what ZenML actually does is it uses MLflow and it uses evidently together to build this entire pipeline. So ZenML itself, I mean, I think they have already, that's what uh, is the new thing here, they have changed this. They are also doing what MLflow does a little bit, but uh, I think they still use MLflow behind the scenes. So MLflow is still there, 
but you can also use more stuff which MFLow will not do using ZenMFlow. That is that is the key. So what's the final output of your pipeline? Uh, the this was a toy example, so it, it, you know, it doesn't actually use the iris data set, so it's not even uh, worthy to talk about. So, yeah. But essentially you have an artifact that you give There are artifacts, so you can actually see here, you can see yeah. artifacts, you can click through the artifacts and get the model out outputs from here. So it's already there with the client. Uh, a bit of topic, but can you share with us the paper's name or names that you used in your presentation? One of them. Uh, so thank you very much Mark, for the presentation and in five minutes we're going to have our next presenter, uh, Owen Mosby-Zoros, so stay tuned.